Uh, first, I would like to thank to thank uh, everybody for this invitation. I'm really honored and most of all honored to go to talk after Siegfried Zelinski because I'm applying most of the concept he developed uh, earlier in my daily work. So, so I'm uh, Morgan Strikat, uh, Senior Media and Digital Art Conservator at ZKM, Center for Art um, and Media in Karlsruhe, uh, Germany, in the Wissen department. So it's uh, Wissen in German, it's knowledge. It's a department of collection, archives and uh, research. So we are taking care with my uh, colleagues Daniel Ice, software engineer, and Mathieu Vlamanc, a junior conservator, of the digital arts and um, digital digital and media art collection of the ZKM, and especially the software, computer-based, and internet-based collection. So the ZKM collection includes approximately 8,000 works from the 20th and 21st centuries. In this collection has ZKM has collected and or produced about 120 uh, digital artworks with different uh, typologies, interactive and immersive installation, video sculpture, <coughs> web-based, software-based, video-based, and so on. ZKM hosts uh, two museums, a media technology research institute called the Arts Lab, the Laboratory for Integrated Video System, and a media library. Today, I will also represent the PAMAL Group, which is a preservation and art media archaeology lab. We are a European artistic group composed of artists, media theorists, conservator wrestlers, and engineers uh, developing media archaeologist um, artistic practice based on media archaeology practice of conservation and restoration of digital and media art. The PAMA group is creating its own works from um, digital artwork that have disappeared or been severely uh, damaged due to the obsolescence of computer software and hardware. Its work seeks to make visible the, vulner the vulnerability of an art form that is highly dependent on industrial heritage, uh, industrial logic. All the work that the collective reconstructs as close as possible to the original materialities, sometimes in a deficient uh, way, are treated as archives. So I will start this conference um, by presenting you the conceptual background on which ZCAM has developed its preservation strategy for digital and media artworks. And my two colleagues will present you practical cases um, afterwards. So due to, um, like everybody knows, obsolescence of software and hardware, digital and media artworks have compared to other forms of art uh, as a short uh, lifespan. In recent years, um, artworks, but also pioneering artists, have uh, begun to disappear, letting their precious archives and related knowledge dying with them. Often uh, based on a materialist conception of art, the conservation restoration of digital and media artworks has taken the name of preservation, focusing then on what immaterial is in the work, the material being then doomed to death, the care is focused on the source code. It is not only a question of keeping it as it is by renewing the data storage media, but also of preserving its readability despite the evolution of hardware and the piling up of software. To meet this challenge, the preservation method mainly proposed emulation, which makes it possible to read an obsolete uh, program with a current machine by simulating its original environment. Porting, which consists in rewriting the code to adapt it to a new digital environment. And reinterpretation, which consists in recreating the work. In all these cases, the code material original relationship is destroyed. Using the reproduci reproducible nature of computer files, um, sorry, I can't read. Using the reproducible nature of computer files and the possibility of obtaining significantly identical effects with different languages, the notion of original writing seems to have disappeared. This is the argument used for rewriting the code or reinterpreting it for preservation purposes. Because it is true that any program can be reduced to binary, 
and in the end to differences in electrical voltages. And in this sense, in this sense no work is ever obsolete. But every artist, every digital artist, is first and foremost the explorer of his and her media. In this case, the code, the material, and or the networks. The sensitive effects of the work result from a dialogue between the human and the machine, which is reflected by the very act of writing. Consequently, how can we, conservator Ressler, sneak inside the code and change it to fit a newer technological environment for which it was never meant for? There is nothing neutral about code or computer the artist used. They translate either how they envision future technologies or the influence of business model or political strategies of the industrial world on their productions. Any work of digital art is a writing whose possibilities are conditioned by the machines. In a computer, this condition corresponds to a stack of software, the lowest level of which allows the transition from symbolic to real. Ontologically, a digital writing, artistic or not, whether it is sound, image, text or gesture, is or all of this at the same time, is based on a succession of layers which not only makes it possible, but also gives it a meaning. However, the particularity of digital and media work is that it is highly dependent on the rules of industry that is applied to all layers. This is particularly true for network-based artworks. A digital work is then nothing more than the product of a relationship between the creation of an industrial world, that is an economic, a world, legal, techno-scientific and political, and an artist who came to explore its effects. So how can we overcome the logic of obsolescence without denying the materiality of digital artworks? Second original is one possible answer. Media archaeological reconstruction, or second original, is a concept born within PAMAL Group. Uh, it's defined as a duplication or a reconstruction of an artwork that has disappeared or is considered obsolete with its original writing and reading machines, so the hardware and the software. This reconstruction does not exclude either emulation or simulation, which can be used to recompose a particular part of the work. Daniel will explain more about this. This reconstruction can be considered at the end as an archive of the work itself. Its advantage is that it helps preserving the hard work as much as the industrial heritage. ZKM is applying this uh, complementary conservation strategy for its collection to promote the conservation of its collection in their um, in the artworks in their historical technological environments. Technology and code, like I said, are as a form of expression not neutral. Media archaeological reconstruction gives the public a unique chance to see concrete form of past media in action and conservators like us to experience the artworks conception. There's something important is that ZKM started collecting digital artworks in 1989 and during this period standardized approaches to managing digital art collections did not yet exist. So we had to work backwards, backwards and build a dedicated interdisciplinary team to take care of the 120 digital artworks of the collection. For the conservation, restoration and presentation of digital art pieces, ZKM is following a cross-disciplinary, cross-department model, which is the most effective model for a museum as expanding as ZKM with such a large collection. Two departments are sharing this responsibility, the department VISIN, Collection, Archive and Research, and the department Museum and Exhibition Technical Services. ZKM cross-disciplinary team where we are all part, is composed of, a special, of specialists coming from the field of restoration, electrical engineering, computer science, art history, with really specific insights such as Mac Classic, SGI computers, or Linux programming. So like I said, 
ZKM promotes the conservation of its digital artworks in their historical, technological environment. This implies to keep as long as possible the artworks within their historical uh, software and hardware components. Not necessarily with the computer we acquired along with the artwork. It can be the same model or at least um, uh, from the same period, compatible with the initial operating system. And to maintain old uh, artworks alive, we are um, basing our preservation strategy on the, the motto, uh, lots of copies keep stuff safe from the, by the Stanford University Library and this concept of second original from the PAMA group. That means that we are always trying to accompany the artwork with a ready to run s a spare computer and spare hardware and peripherals if needed, so mouse, cameras, uh, sensor screens. And instead of letting um, the backups onto our servers, our magnetic tape, we additionally implement them on a spare computer in order to create um, multiple identical and functional example of the whole hardware software environment. This is part of the preventive conservation strategy, coupling then the redundant data backup and the purchase of spares. So duplication. Why? Why are we doing this? I think, first of all, it's important to say it's because we can. It's not something I'm saying like this. It's we, we have shelves and shelves of spare parts. And um, for computer, for CRT monitors, we have backup of operating system, plugins, drivers, libraries that we've been gathering since the opening of the ZKM in the 90s. Second, uh, since we are documenting early acquired artworks afterwards, this is actually the easiest way to gather missing information. Third, this allows us to act smoothly in case of a breakdown during exhibition, because this avoids discovering unknown hardware specificities, incompatibilities and license key issues by actually testing the backups on their assigned equipment prior breakdown, which of course removes any kind of time pressure. Also by uh, duplicating, we do not have to make major changes of the software environment or peripherals and it then avoid any alteration of the artwork's behavior and outputs. Finally, and I think it's even more important, it gives the public the opportunity to experience the artwork as initially when it was created with its, with its uh, wear and tears, glitch and bugs. These artworks presented in this state are an entry point into software studies, media theory, media archaeology, and so on. This is a way to experience the alternative practices used by artists to explore their media. This approach is also helpful for us, for ZKM workers and researchers. Since this artwork are repaired or partially rebuilt with old spare parts, the tacit practical user knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. For example, how to install MS-DOS 5 with a floppy, how to boot an Amiga, how to repair an Apple II, how to operate an Commodore 64, how to hijack an IRIX license key, and so on. It could be said we have a really strong materialist approach. And we know for a fact that this decision is putting us sometime in really, really difficult situations. But this kind of historical curiosity is really motivated by our need to preserve not only artworks, but also knowledge. We are accidentally preserving the industrial heritage. Industry has never preoccupied by preserving its knowledge and use. So we created the technical and industrial museums. And they ended up with, I'm sorry, but dead inert machines and their showcases as example of our heritage. I will say it's plastic heritage. Because artists use those machines of their time to do something particular with it, the art museums are, again by accident, the only place where you can see them in action because they fulfill a purpose. So what happens if we are updating everything all the time? The theory of perpetual and contextual updating is a functionalist approach. Under the pretext of wanting to preserve the accessibility of the work, 
it became the discrete accomplice in the race for innovation and commercial profits. Contextual reconstruction aims at all costs to find the current equivalent of an older technology, both in its function and its concept. Thus eliminating all materiality and any notion of media technical environment. We are not trying to guess what the work what the work would have looked or sound like if the artist, artists had access to contemporary technologies. As a conservator, is it not my role to conserve and restore our heritage for future generations? So it seems to me that perpetual contextual updating only creates new knowledge while burying old knowledge that we barely assimilated. But, <laughs> of course, we actually have to be pragmatic. And most of the time, this historical version of the artwork is only exhibited in-house for research purposes because of its high uh, fragility and dependency to industrial hegemony. So we need our facilities, skills, resources, spares, and tools to install and furthermore maintain those artworks in exhibition. So at the same time, we are uh, preparing, like we are systematically preparing the works for migration to contemporary computer system and software um, at the same time. So we do not want to, preve to prevent other museums which might not have those resources to have access to our collection, neither the public. So for loan purposes and future exhibitions, we create updated version, the closest to the initial version within a newer technological environment for easier handling, installation, and maintenance. This version is usually created with the help of the artist. You will see that with Mathieu. And it is very important while the historical version is still in working order. And if not, it will be repaired. And if it doesn't exist anymore, it will be rebuilt from scratch with historical spare. And this is the topic of today. To create updated version of an art piece, no documentation can be more efficient than the initial work itself. We need this first-hand experience of how the artwork operates and looks and sounds like in its given historical technological context. This allows us to learn more about the artist's techniques and methods to hijack certain technologies' prior purposes. This experience is paramount to gather vanishing knowledge and compare the results of the updating process. So my colleagues are, gonna, are going now to present three practical cases. The first uh, practical, there's sound, we don't need sound on this one. <laughs> it's okay. Um, this is virtual sculpture by Geoffrey Shaw, 1981. It's a pioneering augmented reality installation. The installation used Apple II computer you, uh, with its uh, game paddles attached to the monitor to register the tilt and uh, rotation movements. The projected images shown simple, slowly turning wire frame um, objects. We can't remove this one, it's okay. On December 12th, uh, 2018, Jeffrey Shaw offered ZKM the opportunity to acquire as a donation, uh, five exclusive works spanning 52 years um, of what is considering it as this milestone to ensure their longevity. Virtual sculpture no longer exists and must be reconstructed. We started then uh, a challenging media archaeological reconstruction of virtual sculpture with an Apple II computer. Uh, an historical reconstruction, actually, of this artwork is highlighting the innovative and pioneering aspect of this early augmented reality system. We also wanted, with this case study, to take the chance to gather more knowledge about this former technology and grow our network with the Apple II community in Europe. Many artists used Apple II technologies, as Chris Marker, for example, whose artworks are belonging to the Centre Pompidou in Paris. The reconstruction of this artwork is likely to be exemplary for the history of computer science in regard to digital artistic creation, as well as the study of the technical and technological possibilities developed by Apple and used by artists at this period. For example, uh, the reconstruction of Dialector, an early artificial, uh, artistic artificial intelligence created by Chris Marker in the late 
1980s by the Poptronics Group research, uh, research Group is a good example of the current enthusiasts in the field. So this first practical case serves mostly research purposes. The second case study is a group of three artworks, uh, You Begetto with Watchdog, White Devil and Border Patrol from the late 80s and beginning of 90s, created by Paul Garin and uh, David Rockaby. The first two uh, artworks are groundbreaking interactive laser disc uh, video artworks, and the third is using Macintosh video tracking system. Uh, this project started in 2017 when ZKM initiated a general assessment of its collection to target especially early acquired artwork without documentation. Since ZKM did not establish conservation and, poli and management policies at the moment of acquisition, the crates of these artworks have remained in the depot for 10 years without being exhibited or restored. So the need for digital art conservation at that time was not even understood. You have to think about it. It was new technology, the hedge of the innovation. Nobody could imagine it will become obsolete or it could fail or disappear with time. So at that time, there were no such thing than backup or archival copies, dedicated computer or documentation strategies. So this artwork's software were stored on computers put it into storage for 10 years, and that's all. So the 16 craze of the free artworks has been opened in March 2018. A first inventory of the material has been done, and the computer has been inspected. Of course, all Macintosh hard drives were obviously badly damaged by this long storage. Computers CMOS batteries leaked onto CPUs of the Amiga's computer. Data were completely lost. According to our first assessment, a full reconstruction of the artworks was necessary. The lack of documentation on those artworks was absolutely dramatic. We had 16 crates of equipment without any wiring diagram or any behavior documentation. The easiest and fastest way for us to understand the work was to just set it up as original and get it working. So. Of course, we could have reconstructed these artworks with the help of Paul Garin, as well as new technology to do exactly the same in a hand-sized computer. And I'm not saying that to solve some of the transition to contemporary media, we may in some cases need to emulate our, uh, the behavior of the legacy environment. But even though Paul Garin sent us clips where we can see the quirky behavior of the Lazarus playback, we couldn't reconstruct it from scratch if we didn't experience it first. So we decided to do a media archaeological reconstruction of the free artworks. We just finished a one-year research project with Paul, with whom, which without whom a reconstruction wouldn't have been possible. And the whole reconstruction step by step of the artwork was precisely documented and the final reconstruction considered as an archive, allowing us, restorer and technicians, to understand the work and undertake restoration. Without this reconstruction, some paramount information would have been lost. Because afterward, we realized that the transition to contemporary media would have been at high risk to lose the character of this unprecedented system. In Indeed, these three artworks are retrospectively paramount for the history of interactive video art. David Rockaby, the engineer who worked with Paul Garin, created and designed custom-made software and hardware to bend the technology to do what the industrial world wouldn't offer at that time. The technology didn't exist, so they created it. How artists envision future technologies is what we intend to explore with this case study. So Mathieu will uh, give some insight on this project. Uh, this uh, no, then second uh, reconstruction project led them to a better understanding and therefore better documenting and therefore better updating of these artworks, but also to real technological discoveries of the past. Finally, Daniel Ice uh, will present the third uh, case study, Wipe Cycle and uh, Track Trace from uh, Frank Gillette and Ira Schneider, and Track Trace only from Frank Gillette. So in the course of the preparation of our exhibition, uh, 
Radical Software, the Rain Dance Foundation, Media Ecology and Video Arts at ZKM, we were again confronted with the task to reconstruct two historical video artworks, uh, only on the basis of documentation, uh, like textual description, drawing, videos and memories of the artists themselves. To resurrect this work as close as possible to the original version, we developed a tool chain of universally applicable modules based on easy accessible hardware and open source software to close the gap between analog video things like TVs and modern video services like digital cameras and digital video playback devices. We implement tasks like time shift of video on video feeds, programmable switching between video signal, on the fly image processing and video wall signal distribution. With this set of modular comb combinable entities, it is possible now to imitate many of the concepts and effects that were used in video art during the last century. So this last reconstruction project aims at uh, facilitating the exhibition and access to video artworks and creating a general method for a transition from analog to digital. So I will now my colleague Mathieu give you the real technical insights. On the technique now. <laughs> um, so, hello. I'm Mathieu Vlamink. I'm a junior media art and uh, digital art conservator. Uh, that's my actually first international conference, so I'm very honored to be here and I would like to thank personally everyone involved. Um, so the first project I will uh, talk about is a virtual sculpture from uh, Jeffrey Shaw. So for a bit of background, in the late uh, 70s, Jeffrey Shaw and his event structure research group partner Theo Botschuer embarked on a series of computer graphic and augmented reality experiments that were inspired by two technologies. So the first one on the left uh, it's an age-old illusion technique called Pepper's Ghost that dates back to the 16th century. Uh, that's a technique that uses a see-through mirror to create a ghost image that seemingly floats in space. <coughs> the second on the right, uh, it's a pioneering virtual reality head mountain display, or HMD, invented by Jan Sutherland in 1968, which he called the Sword of Damocles. Their uh, first artwork that resulted from their joint research was called uh, Virtual Sculpture in 1981. The optical method based on Pepper's Ghost is updated in Virtual Sculpture by using a video image and a Fresnel lens to change the focal length so that the image appears some meters away when viewed through the semi-transparent mirror. The systems rotate and tilt function then allow these virtual images to be physically disturbed all around the viewer. So it was really an interactive artwork. Um, it was using an Apple II computer to create the 3D wire from graphic imagery, a tripod mounted CRT monitor fitted with a Fresnel lens and a see-through mirror. An interactive design using Apple II game paddles uh, attached to the monitor to register the tilt and rotation movements allow the viewer to move it. They could then discover animated computer-generated virtual objects floating, around, floating uh, about uh, different locations in the physical exhibition space. This artful apparatus prefigured the uh, augmented reality uh, that were introduced into the market uh, some 20 years later and which are currently, of course, uh, a fast-developing industry. Unfortunately, the, the original version, this one called Megveld, no longer exists. All we had now was an inventory number, some information, and the artist's mind. So for the reconstruction, uh, we bought an Apple II Plus on eBay. But there was uh, one problem, actually. It arrived damaged and non-functional. It was coming from the USA, so that was a long trip. <laughs> so what could I do to repair it? Because uh, actually this technology is, was done before I was born. I'm only 28. Um, but fortunately, it came with all the manuals 
And uh, at that time, um, Apple has included, unlike today actually, all the schematics and documentation about the operation and maintenance of the machine. So I just had to read it and make a beautiful board. <laughs> In one day, I studied all the motherboard working and I knew how it was functioning. Um, so I checked first um, which part were damaged on the motherboard. So there were 10 computer chips, including RAM memory, that you can see on the orange sticks on the right. Um, there was a slot contact on the top that became rusty, actually, so I cleaned them one by one. But unfortunately, the two uh, video uh, chips here were too much damaged and not repairable, so we had to order a second and malfunctioning also Apple II Plus, but not the same way, so I managed actually to take the two video chips put them on the first one, and I have a fully uh, functional device. For the software, uh, Jeffrey Shaw and Larry Abel used a niche one, so it was only known by an informed public at the time. It was called the Sublogic A2 3D1 Animation Library. So for a bit of uh, Wikipedia information, Sublogic Corporation, uh, it's an American software development company that was formed in 1975 by Bruce Hartwick while he was attending at the University of Illinois. Uh, they created actually the infamous flight simulator game. That was a screenshot of the first version in uh, 1980. Uh, the company also produced software uh, like children's educational software, the 3D graphic uh, library, and also video cards and 3D graphic software for PC. So the next step was to source, install, and learn this library to be able to uh, recreate the artwork. And we had no cassettes, disk, or data available. But by happy chance, Bruce Hartwick himself uh, uploaded on archive.org what he said, a scan of a photocopy of a manual for the sublogic uh, routines that you can see here. So it's not very good quality, but it was readable. And also, according to him, this manual contains enough to be able to use the program as the software is pretty unusable without this documentation. And I soon discovered that it was the case. Uh, the manual is 92 pages of pure mathematics. So one could expect that you have to know a bit of uh, mathematics to do uh, 3D stuff. <laughs> But today's software, as I learned, um, is, uh, it's helping you a lot, actually, to do that. But given the Apple II's age, you simply cannot have this kind of help. So you need to have some uh, advanced space mathematics knowledge. And um, everything is needed to be pro programmed line by line in assembly language. So for those who don't know what it is, assembly language is a low-level programming, uh, one designed to, uh, for a specific type of processor. You had to wake up early to do this type of programming, as writing assembly language is a tedious process, since each of the operation must be performed at a very basic level. While it may not be necessary to use assembly code to create a computer program today, learning assembly language is often part of a computer science curriculum since it provides useful insights into the way processor works. And I was really glad I got this training. So then to implement the written application, we could use either the original uh, floppy drives, so the two here, the first one containing the uh, operating system and the second one uh, containing the software. So that's five and a quarter inch old uh, floppies. Or also we could use this floppy emulator here, which uses a micro SD card, which is more reliable today because they tend to not age well those, but that's less uh, Apple II aesthetic. Uh, we also bought, uh, as you can see here, the two uh, game paddles, so you have the, the tilt and pan, uh, to be able to test, of course, uh, the software. 
So while this artwork has recently entered ZKM's collection, uh, Jeffrey Shaw created an updated version of the disappeared artwork. The reconstruction of the CRT monitor, Fresnel lens, and the see-through mirror, and tripod assembly are faithful to the original as possible. Similarly, the appearance of the animated computer graphic images, so the simple low resolution wireframe objects, uh, were also replicated, but this time using a more modern PC and software rather than the old uh, Apple II and the obsolete sublogic library. So that's the first project. The second one, um, so Paul Garin, uh, for a bit of background, is uh, part of a second generation of American video artists whose work combines masterful technological innovation with pungent social critique. Garin, who began working with the video while at the Cooper Union School of Art in New York, was an assistant and collaborator of Nanjun Pike, uh, beginning in 1981. Uh, yeah, we'll try to see if it's okay. Yeah, I will first explain you Pigeto with Watchdog and then show you a bit because there's the. Lights a bit. Yeah, that's the three videos um, that we had at first. So you Ghetto with Watchdog consists of a uh, video mural that you can see here uh, showing a swan cocktail party. So you can see the guest in formal wear chatting pleasantly and toasting in on posts. Uh, the party goer seems oblivious to the scene of war and carnage that flashed outside the, the window. And this interior was protected by a wall of cement blocks, a chain link fence, razor wire, and a German shepherd, or rather a video of a German shepherd. Um, and as visitors approached the, the gate, uh, the dog was starting to bark at them, to snarl and snap its jaws. So I will show you a bit. So you can see the dog here, that's the fence, and you have the party video on the background. Yes, here is. <laughs> and you could do graffitis actually on the wall, there were spray cans. So that's it. So that's Ghetto. The uh, second one, White Devil, uh, is a bit more complicated than this one, technically. Um, so you have also a video mural that showed a large estate, uh, complete with manicure lawn and a handsome car, parked flamboyantly in the drive, and the rest was burning to the ground. Before it, you had a pit made of uh, video monitors that contained a white pit bull, that was following the visitors along and barking at them. So, um, I think that's going to work directly. No? Yes. So, you have a bit of showing also of the technical side of uh, White Devil. Yeah, that was the only documentation we had a bad quality of video. That's actually the 92 version. Some of the uh, hardware included in the computer were different um, at ZCAM. So you can see the dog.
so that was not easy to make a video because it was really in the dark. So, yeah. So uh, UPGetto and White Devil uh, were both using uh, serial control laser disc players that can do an instant jump cut uh, to any clip of the dogs within plus or minus 100 frames. Uh, White Devil, as you saw, is more complex uh, because the laser disc player were mounted as a pair coupled with time-based uh, correctors. The jump between active and queuing pair of laser disc player are indistinguishable. The dogs move smoothly and follows the visitor through the 12 monitors. For both hard work, uh, David Rockaby's very nervous system can track a person's movement in a large space. A video camera sends images to a computer that analyzes consecutive frames to detect motion and presence. Using custom-made electronics and software, Rockaby's system allows to display different set of clips according to the visitor's position within a zone. So the very nervous system was used again in a border patrol. And I will talk first about uh, the piece uh, is made up of a wall topped with a razor wire, multiple embedded screen on the front. You have four robotic cameras. Uh, that are mounted on the wall and they are paired with a secondary stationary tracking camera. They function as visual sensor to the VNS interface that control the positioning of robotic cameras to follow people as precisely as possible. The robotic cameras are very fast and have very long imposing lenses on them. Spookily, as the camera follows the visitors, they are always looking directly down the barrel of the lenses. The images from the robotic cameras are displayed on the embedded screens and when the system has locked onto the, uh, a head, a crosshair will form and the sound of a submachine gun fire will rip out the hefty subwoofers behind the wall. Each of the four cameras can track up to 32 individual objects and monitor their status. So that was quite awesome for the time. So that's the... So you have the monitors, you can see a bit of hardware here. The Amiga computers, we will talk about that later. And you have the robotic camera for filming the people. So they are mounted to really powerful stepper motors to, to be able to follow. And you can see, yeah, that's the stationary camera for detection. And this one is for the, the display. So for those three artworks, there were never any documentation made. Uh, all we found actually was uh, some uh, paper notes on the crates made by Paul himself. And uh, the setup was done uh, by him each time it was exhibited. So after doing a full inventory of what we had, we began to clean the reading head of the LaserDisc player and uh, also the Macintosh computers before starting the tests. The first problem was with the uh, UP Ghetto Macintosh computer. So that's the Macintosh Quadra 605 from the beginning of uh, 1993. Uh, it was not powering on. So simple problem, simple solution. I just changed the power supply here. Uh, but there was another problem. The fan was spinning, but I had no sound or display, nothing at all. I've done some researches and I found that on those generation of computers, the CMOS battery that you can see here, uh, if it's depleted, actually the computer is not booting at all. So also simple problem, simple solution. We had a spare one, I changed it. It was still not booting. So I've done some more 
cholesterol search on the motherboard and uh, two of those capacitors here were uh, damaged. So I managed to take out two other from a non-working motherboard, but the capacitors were okay, and I replaced them, and the Macintosh was finally booting. But there was a third problem. The hard drive actually was not recognized by the Macintosh boot manager. Um, I tried to do a backup of the data with the working station computer to see, but the hard drive was not detected at all, nothing. And uh, we thought that it was badly damaged by uh, long storage. And we were right. We've done a bit of a background check, and we found out that the Quantum brand hard drive that Apple was using on those computers, they were really, really bad, actually. Uh, they failed too quickly. The other problem is that we didn't have any backup of this computer. So for now, all data was lost. I tried everything I could, uh, even to freeze the hard drive for 24 hours to try to unlock the mechanism inside because that can be due to that sometimes without success. So I decided then to open it in safe space. Video, the picture was took after <laughs> to see if I could unlock the mechanism. Uh, and I found two problems inside. First, the rubber, which is supposed to hold, that's the reading head of the hard drive. And it goes this part to bump uh, inside. Here, there's a rubber normally. Uh, it's supposed to damp the, 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 the head. So it had melted over time because it was really bad quality rubber. Uh, and it became completely gooey. So I had to clean uh, all of it. I managed to replace it. Then the head was working again, but the second problem ended all. Actually, the hard drive was completely demagnetized. There were no data on it. So um, normally, the hard drives that don't come into contact with a degausser or strong magnetic fields, of course, or very large uh, temperature variations, uh, they should demagnetize after 40 years at least. So, yeah, all was lost with this drive. So the only thing I could do uh, was just to uh, put another compatible hard drive to reinstall the uh, operating system with the still working macOS original floppies and after replacing the floppy drive that was also out of order. <laughs> so basically on this Macintosh, all that was working uh, was the speaker and the fan. Um, fortunately, a bit later, Paul Garin uh, found out the backup he had of the software, so he managed to send that to us, and I could easily uh, implement it back onto the new hard drive, as the software itself is just self-contained. That was just basically copy-paste. So we were a bit relieved. Uh, we tested the equipment and setup of uh, UP Ghetto in May 2019, but without documentation, we couldn't calibrate the software and it was not behaving uh, properly. So we done it again with Paul himself uh, last month in November. And this time we managed with Morgan to make an extensive documentation of the software content, components, behavior, calibration, and to complete our wiring diagram and documentation of the, docu the communication between computers, laser disk, everything. We asked a million of questions to Paul. Um, so White Devil operate the same way as uh, UP Ghetto, but this time uh, using six laser disks players that are paired together. Uh, the, Paul used actually the Sony LDP-1550 laser disc, especially because at the time it was the only one that could do serial communication to be able to do the, the, the jump cuts. S and there was also, we don't see much there, three time-based correctors that were also plugged and synchronized to the laser disc player uh, to be able to smooth the animation more. Uh, between the pairs of laser disks, because you still had some jump cuts, of course, with all those uh, tech. 
Uh, the Macintosh was the same as Yupigeto. It was using the same uh, Intact 4 software. That's the name of the software that was uh, created by Workerby. So that's really a custom software for the artwork. It was a, a good thing, as the hard drive on this one was also out of order. This program is used to define the eight motion zones that you can see here. So each time you set up the artwork, actually, you have the camera feedback, and you can draw the motion zones to, to be able to detect the presence of the, of the visitors. And these zones are linked to a, a matrix that contains actually uh, the information where the clips are stored on the laser disk to be able to play the right uh, tracking of the tracking clip of the dog. So again, Paul Garin had a, a, a copy of the software, sent it to us, and I implemented it back on a new hard drive. That was easier since I had the experience of uh, UPGETO. So we done first test in October 2019. With, um, we had all the LaserDisc player that have been checked. Five of them were in working order, but a bit unstable. And we had one that was also completely out of order. So we had to take one from UPGETO to replace it, as we had no spare parts at all. This was considered enough, according to the tight schedule, to make a proper test setup with uh, Paul uh, months later. So for the sake of this setup, uh, we used only uh, three monitors instead of the 12. So we didn't plug the video uh, wall monitor, so it was simpler. And we attached the camera to the wall instead of the ceiling, because the ceiling was already busy with a uh, UP ghetto. Um, we used the original exhibition's laser discs. To, to display the dog, and uh, everything was working after two days of work. Just aside of some, we still had a lot of jump cuts because of the laser disc player age. So that was still a problem. But it was basically working. Um, so that will lead to our next uh, challenge, which is the transfer of the laser discs. As of today, we cannot do copies of them anymore. That's why we use the exhibition uh, ones. We are now looking uh, into a way of uh, not only digitize them, but completely imagine them. Because we could uh, very easy to lose the character of the work by simply capturing to digital. We need to be creative on how we solve the transition to contemporary media in order to retain the original integrity. We may, in some cases, need to emulate the behavior of the legacy hardware. So the cue point of each predefined clip, as I explained before, of the dogs uh, for UPGETO and White Devil are contained in the, into the data of the computer. That's the software who defines that. And this code is carried over the, um, the, the laser disk, actually. It uses reference that you can see on the laser disk, you have those parts while storing like the frame codes, how the laser disk is organized. That's a bit like a hard drive when you have uh, the boot partition and the, the, the partition map, actually, to tell where the data is. It's the same principle. Um, so we have to capture that, too, because the only uh, digitization we had was actually just the video transfer, so that's just a video file. And uh, if we cannot carry those codes, we had to cut manually everything. And that's going to be a really, really long work. But as of now, we don't know if there is a way to, to digitize the laser this, this way by keeping the frame codes. So if you know someone, we would be really interested. <laughs> Um, we turned that into a small uh, research project um, to systematically consider a system for the digitizing the laser disk, including time codes. Uh, this goes along with the desire to develop a laser disk emulator to replace the aging ones, since they are not building them anymore, with, uh, for example, a Raspberry Pi. If we obtain the time codes of the frame, we could hopefully reconstruct the transition graph somehow from the code and also simply substitute the laser disk player on in the installation without having to interfere in the work. We found a manual 
which is called Build an Interactive Video Disc Controller with PC. I really like the jacket. Um, this one can be interesting to us uh, because, uh, for example, on the book it's explained that every still captures on a video disc as a unique frame number. So it's going from 1 to 54,000. And using this number, the player control system can identify and search for any one of the 54,000 and display it. So that was the beginning of a lead of how it's really working inside the laser disc. So as I said before, Border Patrol is the most complicated of the three artworks. Surprisingly, the Macintosh LC475 was in a really good shape. It was working better than the two other Quadra 605, and the hard drive was still working, but it was showing signs of uh, fatigue. So I made directly a backup of it and transferred onto a new fully working hard drive. The first uh, difficulties with this artwork came with the four Amiga 2000 computers. They are the ones actually that are responsible to show the target display that you saw before. Um, you have to know they were stored in their own foam padded fly <laughs> cases and the badly degraded foam created a, a toxic dust layer that was really nasty on all of the Amigas, all inside. So we had to carefully uh, clean it, and that took a lot of time. Um, also, another bigger problem was uh, the CMOS batteries inside. They were soldered to the motherboard, so they couldn't remove them. And with the time, there was like acid leak damage on all the four of them. It was a different kind of uh, damage that was going from just small um, acid going on the virgin part of the PCB here to the most damaged one, which was going on the... That's the CPU of the Amiga, by the way. So really not a good thing. So I cleaned uh, all the acid. I managed to replace the CMOS battery. For this one, I had to remove all the housing here, and I resoldered the CPU, but uh, still not working, this one. Uh, also, yeah, we had another problem. Two of the four power supplies of the Amigas were completely uh, out of order. And also, all but one hard drives were working. And there was also quantum hard drives, by the way. Um, but there was nevertheless enough for me to be able to rebuild two fully working Amigas out of the four. Because you don't need to have all the four workings for the test, because Border Patrol is working with uh, two parallel systems. So if you have only half of it, you can do the, the, the first test. Uh, we manage. I had to wear a mask with all the dust and acid stuff. And um, we managed so to have Border Patrol test set up. So you can see like the Aurora cameras here, we have the two Amiga computers, Macintosh. Uh, it worked for five minutes before uh, having actually some technical difficulties because that's all US power. And uh, we learn actually that not only uh, there's the power conversion, the volt conversion, but there's also a frequency conversion. And this, yeah, went, I've, the box, uh, which one is it? That's this one, was starting to smelling burn. And I think it was not, because that's a custom box, and I think it was really designed for the, this type of frequency. But as Paul said to us after that, it's just low tech solving now. So that's all for me. Daniel. Uh -huh. yeah, no, wait.
So, my name is Daniel Heiss and I too work for ZKM. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, I have to say too. Um, I work as a software developer in ZKM and in contrast to Morgan and Mathieu, I work for the other department which takes care for the exhibition part. We prepare the exhibitions and uh, are mostly uh, working on maintaining the currently running exhibitions. And <coughs> as from, from time to time I also work with you guys. So we are one family that's uh, ZKM. Today I want to uh, speak to you about the work that I did on the reconstruction of the installation's wipe cycle and uh, track trace. Wipe cycle by Ira Schneider and Frank Gillette and track trace by Frank Gillette only. Um, especially wipe cycle can be considered groundbreaking in video art, so that's why it was a really honor to work on it because it was the first ever uh, multi-channel video installation in the history, at least that I know of. Um, so on the left you see wipe cycle. How does this work? Ah, okay. um, it consists of nine monitors, three by three. Um, a matrix um, where different content will be displayed in a choreography which is switching. Um, there is a camera image, the camera is on top here, um, you see a live camera image switching here, alternating with a TV program, then you have a delayed camera image on the corners which is 8 seconds delay and 16 seconds delay, those two change regularly and on the middle ones you have a, a pre-recorded video that is um, played in an endless loop. On the other work, track trace, it's uh, from the same guy, so it's also using delay and uh, in this case it's also using uh, space, uh, different perspectives. Um, the, the, the space in front of this pyramid is recorded by three cameras on the corners here and here and one on top. So uh, first thing is that the cameras switch, so there's always one active camera which changes regularly every se three seconds and then there is uh, four different, five different uh, time um, layers which is uh, the live image of one, the active camera on top and then it always gets four seconds delayed. So four seconds here, eight seconds here, 12 seconds, 16 seconds in the past. So you see yourself in different times layers and uh, from different perspectives in many different uh, screens. So uh, it's always the same image on one row. So it's actually five different signals. So this was already quite technical, but um, I feel like I, perhaps before I get too much in the other technical stuff, uh, this was the, the occasion why we did this work was uh, this exhibition in 2017, the ZKM prepared the exhibition Radical Software, the Rainlands Foundation Media, Ecology and Video Art. It was created by George Baker, um, Judith Beer and Margit Rosen. Um, the exhibition presented video works and installations of pioneering group of American artists and scientists uh, who called themselves the Raindance Foundation. They were using medium the medium video as a tool for new artistic expression, as a new form of communication. It was the wish of the curatorial team to include these two artworks I showed you before in the exhibition. So um, there was only one problem. Both artworks were not existing, so at least not in a physical form. They have been shown at this uh, point uh, in 1969 and 72 and not really afterwards. I'll tell you more about that later. 
this is not really surprising because from a conservational point of view, um, these early video artworks differ a bit from the newer computer-based media art installations that Mathieu described in his work, in his lecture, in, in contrast to computer art based uh, computer-based art, um, where the computer and the software are often an integral um, part of the work, so it's uh, mostly attributed to the work. Uh, in video art, the used equipment was rarely uh, kept with the work itself. Most of the time, uh, the period for which this video artworks were created was only limited to days or weeks for special occasions like galleries, shows, or a festival or something like this. And so afterwards they dismantled the video work and um, the equipment which was used went back to where it came from. It was borrowed or, or rented and rarely it was the artist who owned all the equipment because it was simply too expensive. Um, so you could say video art was more kind of a festival art made for special occasions but not yet for the museum or for collectors. Of course there are exceptions such as the installations by Pike who painted sometimes directly on the TV or, or used the, the, the electronic stuff as a part of his sculptures so as he, he turned it into a sculpture. But one can say that is rather an exception in this time. Um, okay, so for us it became clear we had to reconstruct wipe cycle and uh, track trace from scratch. So there was only documentation on how it was made, but we didn't have any hardware or anything else. So I will show you a short video of... No? Come on. So this is a video of the original. No, why does it not work? <laughs> oh no. It was working before. It worked on my computer. Um, okay, so now I can show you the original setup of Wipe Cycle in the Howard Stern Gallery. Uh, Howard Weiss Gallery, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, this uh, is not really, um, it's not bad because we have something like this. Actually, this is even better because if you see the video, you would say, um, okay, I don't really get what's happening here because it's a bit confusing if you see all the programs switching around in a very, it, at first it looks like a bit of random uh, pattern, uh, but then there is something like this. It's uh, the the uh, drawing that was made by Frank Gillette and Ira Schneider for the first issue of the newsletter Radical Software, which was published by the Rainlands Foundation, where they described their work and. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best examples for good, clear documentation of a work where you have everything on one side. It's all there, what you need to uh, reconstruct the work from a functional point of view. So you know what it's doing. You still don't know how it is made, but you, you get what it is doing. So here again you can see it's uh, alternating programs in the middle live, means the live camera. It changes every four seconds with the broadcast TV back and forth. On the uh, corners you have on this screen and this screen, it's always doubles. Eight second delay, eight second delay which exchanges with the other corners on this and this one, 16 seconds delay from the live camera. So, And on the middle ones you have videos pre-recorded stuff, this and this the same, and this and this the same, which also exchanges at another rate, I think four seconds. Yeah. So there is the rest of the description that you need to fully get what this thing is doing. 
Um, we had the luck to uh, Ira Schneider and Frank Ginette, Fr Frank Gillette are still alive, of course. Um, and Ira Schneider lives in Berlin for 20 years now. So we were in close contact with him for the exhibition preparations. He also donated his archive, video archive to ZKM. And so it was easy for us to talk to him and ask questions. And uh, when we asked him how the switching was done and stuff like this, we had him on the phone. He said, oh, uh, no problem. I sent you a, I sent you a drawing. Um, then you will get it. And this is what he sent. <laughs> um, it's a bit confusing. And, uh, but you can get some, some uh, something from it. So here he describes how the delay was made. It was three tape recorders, these open reel um, tape recorders that were, or, or no, it was one tape recorder and two tape players, let's say. And uh, they were connected uh, to the camera on top of the t uh, thing. So the tape recorder recorded the live camera signal and the information recorded onto the tape went slowly through the room, uh, through space, and to the next uh, station where it was then played back. So the time it took for the tape to go from this to that was the delay that you would later see on, this, on the camera signal. So it was two of them, one for the eight second delay and one for the 16 second delay. This, is, uh, this shows how it uh, was, how they used uh, curtain rollers somehow. I don't know uh, how they did it, but it was really messy. What we know is that they uh, never could leave the work alone in the gallery, so they had constantly to stay next to it because it crashed every two hours or even worse. This thing here is more interesting because um, I, I didn't get it in the first place. I thought this is some kind of uh, a belt that's going around and he couldn't really explain it to me. Um, later it became clear, so actually this here is a motor and there's a rod attached to the motor and this spins in this way and there are screws on the rod and uh, it's for making electrical trigger impulses in a, diff in a certain uh, period. So this is the actual software of wipe cycle was done in a mechanical way by uh, rotating screws that touched to uh, metal parts in a certain speed. So um, first we tried to transfer this drawing into a more uh, understandable uh, scheme. So here again you can see his camera, the, th the delay part. Um, what he didn't mention in his drawing, so of course there was uh, the, the playback for the pre-recorded material, so two uh, videotape players. And one interesting detail is we never thought about it until we, um, how, how do you playback videotape in an endless loop? So um, it's two reels, you have it first on the one reel and then you play it back to the other reel and then it's there and you have to rewind or, or if you play it uh, the other way it just runs backwards so that's not um, what you want. And uh, it was 1969 that they built this, later there were devices that could do this, so special cartridges which uh, had this included so you could put it on the tape recorder and now you had a 10 minute endless loop. Um, but to this time they didn't have it so and uh, then it um, turned out they just didn't loop, they had a special um, device which just detected when the uh, movie was finished and then it played back, it rewind it, rewound automatically and started the playback again. So there was always this short break when the rewind was uh, taking place. This was n uh, not documented anywhere so this was something we had to find out on our own. Um, you see everything is connected to the switch box and this was, till we really thought about it, it was simply not clear how this worked. So um, 
we had this vague descriptions of the artists and uh, the problem was that um, they didn't do it on their own. This is something we learned in this process by asking questions too. They had a TV, te TV technician who, who uh, built this device for them. So um, they didn't know themselves how it really worked. So we tried to find a solution how it could have worked. So um, it was a mixture of mechanical parts through this rotating and the um, relay. Uh, some 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 relay electronic parts. So you see here is two switches which symbolize the contacts that touched were touched by the screws. Those triggered flip flops, toggle flip flops. So if they get an impulse, like you see here, they change the state. They get active or passive with every other impulse. They just change the state, and uh, so they could do this signal switching of the um, video signals that landed on the TV. What I didn't mention so far is there was a th uh, uh, another component which gave actually the name to this installation, the wipe cycle. The wipe cycle is just a black image which travels around the outer TVs in a loop. So it was uh, erasing one by one the the uh, content of the display. And this was um, done by, so you couldn't uh, just uh, think about, because it, it was the same signal on the uh, corners and the same signal on this one, but the uh, wipe cycle was only on one screen all the time. So you had to um, add another eight relays which could turn off the, the corresponding TV one by one. Um, so this is what we came up with and uh, everybody I showed this so far agreed so it could work like this. The only part is this. Uh, I, I didn't uh, include it in the scheme. You need another uh, IC or a switch register which uh, triggers with every impulse, it just goes one um, further to the next input. Um, that, I hope this works. Why not? I show you this on another. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it again, maybe. Or maybe I can play it back from here. No. So we, we just created a 3D simulation of, of this uh, thing that was the mechanical part to, to, to uh, get a, an, an understanding how it should have worked. Okay, so uh, anyways, I, I will show it to people who are interested afterwards. Um, it was this, uh, just, it was really simple. So one screw for the eight second delay, which traveled around 600, uh, 360 degrees for one impulse. Then there were on top, there were two screws in 180 degrees uh, configuration. So this was the half of the pulse. So every four second it touched the, the contact and then there was a two second uh, impulse thing with four screws. And so you had this f uh, three um, different time levels, which um, uh, which just did this cold choreography on, on the work. So um, actually, it was not true that it didn't exist since 1969. There were two other reconstructions made with Wipe Cycle for an event at the uh, Kölnischer Kunstverein and the Berliner Kongresshalle, both in 1989, done by Dieter Selin. The funny thing is, Dieter Selin is uh, working now at the HFG, which is right next to ZKM. And so also we could contact him, how he did these reconstructions. And uh, all he said about it was, 
it was terrible. It, uh, so uh, he, he tried to do the same what they did back then with uh, VHS tape, video uh, cassette tape, and uh, had the same problems, of course, like uh, back then. So it uh, just went, worked for a few minutes or hours, and then it just crashed again. So this was not an option for us to go the same road. So um, what else we got from Ira was this um, digital wipe cycle software. It was done by a, a student in, from the TU Berlin. It was a Java program that he gave us, which uh, actually emulated this uh, wipe cycle behavior on one screen. But you could uh, adjust it so you could uh, use nine computers and uh, let them communicate over network and then it would do more or less the same like WipeCycle did. We tried this uh, software and quickly realized it's the switching was really digital, so it looked not really good. There were sometimes there were uh, uh, glitches, digital glitches in, in the camera image. You had to use a USB camera because the software was only thought to use USB camera and um, so before we started to uh, rewrite this code that the student wrote, we thought, okay, no, we go a different road, we just do it all on our own from scratch. We um, start this our way. So this is what I came up with as a setup for the um, new version of WipeCycle. It's um, six Raspberry Pis. They are uh, all connected over Ethernet and um, there is a networked camera, it's an IP camera that you can connect with uh, Ethernet. This, at first this sounds a bit, no, this doesn't fit right, but uh, you can also uh, use a normal analog camera with this and uh, on one of those raspberries you add a capture device for analog signal and then you could use a normal analog camera. So that's not the point, it was just for convenience that we, from the optics, it looked more or less the same like an old camera because it was, was, it was two in a housing. So um, here again we see the zero delay, the live camera image, which was received over Ethernet by this Raspberry. And then the, the, the good thing about the Raspberry Pi is, uh, everybody who knows it, uh, it has an, still an analog out, so it was really easy for us to connect Raspberry to a TV, and the TV was uh, obligatory or uh, mandatory for, for uh, this installation because we, you can't do a reconstruction of such an important uh, artwork with flat screens or something, this just wouldn't fit. So instead of using a PC with VGA output where you convert to a composite signal that you can uh, input then to the TV, we just used raspberries, which have this by default natively. Um, this buffering here for the delay, I will explain in a second. Um, you can use a Raspberry as a TV receiver. There's a lot of IP uh, TV channels that you can receive over Raspberry, which is also an advantage when you do it this way, because not everywhere where you go you have uh, cable TV uh, connection or whatever, but internet is most likely everywhere. And of course you can play video in a loop on a Raspberry. And then again, we have this switching device. Uh, this time we built this with an, uh, a modern IC, a cross-point video switch called FMS6501. This had an interface to, uh, that you could talk to with an Arduino or a microcontroller. So you could map the inputs of this IC where it received component signal to the outputs which were 12 inputs, nine outputs. It was a perfect fit for wipe cycle. And uh, so we only use six inputs, but um, then you can do everything you need to do for this installation. Um, the delay um, part boils down to some li one line of code, actually. Um, if you are familiar with GStreamer, which is a really, really mighty and uh, useful tool for uh, media art and 
Media Art Conservators. Um, it's, a, it's a framework of, of uh, modular components which can receive, send, process and buffer and uh, do everything with audio and video. You just plug it together like you need it and then you have uh, mostly uh, that what you want. Um, so this was the original version, so two tape recorders which loop this tape. This is the new version, just a Raspberry, costs 50 euros or something and one line of code. Uh, actually, we, you can use GStreamer over command line. So it, it, it has a command line interface, but you can also use the C library or there's also a Rust library. Um, here you, see, you just receive the, the camera stream, motion JPEG from, from the camera, you pass it to uh, raw frames, and then you put it in a queue and you have to do some uh, parameter magic and then you get an eight second delay, which is just, it buffers the frames into RAM and then it plays them after eight seconds uh, queue, it plays them out. And another important uh, advantage of the Raspberry is that you can directly talk to the frame buffer of the Raspberry and so you don't need even a desktop environment. So you just have the minimal Raspberry install and can display every content directly to the frame buffer. This saves a lot of uh, error prone stuff. This is the switchboard that we uh, built. It's a PCB board that we um, just made or that we ordered after we designed it. So uh, actually it's not all, this is a reference design that we found on the internet. So it's not uh, super special, but it worked very well. So here is a microcontroller. This one has now the logic which switching process should take place. And um, this one is the input part and that's the output part where the TVs are connected. I couldn't find a better photo because it was so built in in the new um, setup. This is the code which actually is everything you need for uh, making wipe cycle happen. You have this, this mapping here where you have an array of arrays. The, the columns are the, the outputs of the TV and the rows are the different states that um, wipe cycle could take. And so you have actually only eight different states wipe cycle can take. So it's the shortest uh, change is always the wipe cycle, which happens every second, uh, every two seconds. So it's the, the middle, uh, the wipe cycle is signal seven. It's changing from one to four, so down to uh, seven on the lower left corner. Then it goes right to eight to nine and then it goes up again to, uh, what do we have here, uh, six and three, two, one. Um, I like this because uh, this is exactly the same encoding like you had in the mechanical part and like you had on the drawing. So it's different representations of, of the same code, uh, the software of wipe cycle, but um, totally different. So this was the first uh, setup uh, for the Raindance uh, radical software exhibition, a bit messy back then. You have the raspberries here and the switchboard and a lot of uh, cables all together. It was stuffed in there. And uh, so for the next, now it's still on display in the exhibition, writing the history of the future. And we made it a bit uh, more transportable and uh, tidy. So in a in case, this is all we need now to, to lend wipe cycle to other institutions. You can easily transport it to another museum and uh, it's more or less plug and play. You just add the TVs and plug the power in and then you have it. Another video which won't work, which uh, shows the end result of the work. I will get the videos on, on the end. 
So, um, but the, the technique that we developed for wipe cycle, like Morgan said in her introduction, is like these small modules that do certain things like a time delay or, or a switching between uh, video inputs that the different cameras or something that you then send on to some other device. These are all like, you can be seen like modules that you um, can use for anything else. And it's, uh, it happened that we already had the next use case for track trace, which was the other work we had to reconstruct where you have these delays again so we just used the same techniques and uh, had this um, additional part here. First uh, used the PC, but then replaced it too with a Raspberry because it simply was not, uh, it was possible to do it all on a Raspberry. So this part uh, chooses which camera to send on to all the other Raspberries and they just do the, the buffering to delay it in time. So that's, uh, around the switch and six raspberries, it was around 500 euros maximum to, uh, in, in terms of equipment for this new setup. Here you see again the signal flow, the, this is black cameras. <laughs> okay, inputs over RTSP is the protocol, then uh, the, the server uh, just chooses one of these input signals and streams it on over UDP to the, all the clients, which then buffer it and output it as video signal. So, um, yeah, um, my approach to this um, reconstruction thing, so um, I would like to give a simple ex uh, definition by my own. Um, so the essence for the reconstruction, like the one we did here, should be that the result is as close to the original as possible, but in the same time you try to find a better and more sustainable technological solution for as many components involved as needed. So you eliminate the weak points, but only those that are uh, needed. Big components like the video tape recorder setup. Uh, uh, used to produce a Okay, um, you can have several use cases where you uh, just have drop in modules. Like every time now we have something with a time delay, like Peter Weibel's new exhibition has. Uh, this installation Ich Zeit Zeit Ich, where he just does, does the same. He has a camera, two cameras with a time delay on two monitors. We could use the same technology, technology um, without any hassle. Um, same we hope to have soon with the Raspberry, which emulates the laser disks, which we have a lot of works that are using laser disks. And um, so if we would have a drop in replacement that just reads serial signals like the same like the laser disc player would and outputs uh, time coded um, video that would be a really nice thing to have so my takeaways for you uh, is not much but uh, look definitely into gstreamer in combination with raspberry it's a cheap open source and really powerful uh, tool that you can use in many different cases. Um, when you have to do work on an installation, try to break it down in all the essential key parts. So dismantle it in your head, what, which part does what and which part can you replace with something without interfering with the rest. And um, this comes of course, with really understanding what this artwork does. We had this disc discussion yesterday. Um, sometimes collectors or museums acquire artworks for whatever reasons, collection, and they don't have a clue what this artwork is actually doing. So this is really bad for uh, the conversation, uh, conservational part. And also, please don't take pictures of multiplex. When you do documentations, nobody needs a picture of a multiplex in a documentation for functionality purpose. <laughs> so, thank you.
for listening. That was long enough. <laughs>